So I would love you to really think, what is the goal? Why am I changing everything all the time? Am I going to get better outcomes by using repetition? Am I going to get better outcomes by having a routine? How much time is this student wasting because they don't know where to start? How much time is this student wasting because they can't find things? How much stress am I having as a family at bedtime because we don't have a set routine to go to bed? Alarm goes off at, say, I mean an alarm goes off that it's bedtime. When I was a kid, the TV show finished and we all knew when it was bedtime. I always ask this at my workshops and most people will say there was a specific TV show. We don't have that anymore. So how about everyone in the family has an alarm at, say, 8.30 bedtime? What happens at 8.30 and have a set routine because you sleep better if you go to bed at a set routine. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sue Larky podcast. As I always say, you have to embrace difference to make a difference. Let's dive into today's podcast. Wow, this week's podcast, I feel like it's a secret I've been forgetting to tell you. I was reflecting like, why don't I talk about this enough? And I was thinking, do you remember when you learned to drive, how it was sort of sensorily overwhelming and you're trying to remember where to put your feet and your hands and focus on the road and then the mirrors and then everything happening at once. And I know when my children were first learning to drive, we couldn't have the radio on and talking, like chatting between people in the car distracted them. But, you know, within a year, and especially in New South Wales, where we do 120 hours, by about 60 hours, you can add the radio. By about 70 hours, you can add people having conversations and more passengers having conversations. So, as we get used to things, we nearly forget what it was like in the beginning. And these two strategies, I would say, were key when I first started working in a specialist setting. And um, I'd just forgotten because I've been doing it for so long. And I was trying to find some tips in my books about this. And I'm like, oh, it's in my early years book. Not so explicit in my teacher assistant and my um, ultimate guide, which are my best-selling books. And I'm like, I have just assumed people know to put these things in place. So as a result, I'm calling this week's podcast the often overlooked strategies because I think I've overlooked talking explicitly about it and lots of us forget. And these are the two R's and I don't mean reading, writing, I mean routines and repetition. They are the most powerful strategies to put in place. And the reason for that, you are using a strength of a child with autism spectrum. Most children with autism spectrum love routines and repetition. They like watching the same things. They like seeing the same things over and over again. Hence, we need to take that love and use it to our advantage. Now, some of you are like, oh, Sue, but don't they need to be flexible? I want to ask you a few questions. Do you like the fact your rubbish bins go out on the same night every week? Do you put your keys in the same spot? Do you buy a similar brand of milk or food? Do you have, you know, um, do you move classrooms every day or do you like having your own desk? Have a think. You have routines and repetition. You're constantly using routines throughout your life. And why do you use routines? So things don't get lost. So you know what to do when, which day to put your rubbish bins out. There's less preparation time. Like, I don't know about you, but with my kids, we sort of had, when they were younger, we basically had the same menu on rotation because they, you know, it was just easier when you're busy with three little kids, you know. Monday night, spaghetti bolognese, Tuesday night, pizza, or we went through taco Tuesday for a while. But the kids love knowing what was for dinner too. So my son, who's always been hungry, wasn't, what's for dinner? You know, and if there was a change, that's fine. And I was looking in my ultimate guide and I like what Anna and I wrote in there that with routines in place, often we see home and school change the routine, thinking the child should get used to change. However, in our experience, the flexibility is choice making within the routine. For example, the routine is get out of bed and get dressed. 
but we wear different clothes on different days. While at school, the right the routine might be do the maths at nine o'clock, but every day you do a different maths activity. So I think that is important to remember. And we have had it made a note here. Please note that for parents of younger children who may insist on sameness, it will improve as the child gets older. And Anna Tullamans, who I wrote you know, lots of my books with, tells this great story where Daniel loved a T-shirt and she literally went and bought every size up at um, Kmart or wherever because she knew he loved it. But I think by the time he got to the biggest size that she bought, he didn't love that T-shirt anymore. He was more open to variety. But this is what I know about me. The higher my anxiety, the higher my rigidity, my higher my need for sameness. So many of you who have come to my workshops, and I hope to see you soon at Face to Face. Oh, it's been so good. I've had my first Face to Face workshop since March 2020. It has been delightful to see people again and chat to people. And I've enjoyed Zoom for different reasons, but it is nice to connect and see people connecting and just being in a room full of other people who face the same challenges or, you know, I don't know. There's just something nice about all being together again. So um, this is what I think, that when we have to get anxiety down, And once we get anxiety down, we can get flexibility up. So that's why I often find when children are feeling less overwhelmed, then we can have variety. So back to my driving example, when my children first started to learn to drive, we tended to go along the same road, sort of get, you know, practicing in our area and where they were familiar. But as they got more confident, as they started to get used to the routine and not so overwhelmed by brake and accelerator, and any of you have taught your kids to drive, it's more their concept of where they are on the road, how we haven't wiped swipe, side swipe cars, I have no idea. So as they get more confident, then you can increase the length of the driving. So in the case of our students, increase the length of activities but also um, they are more relaxed, so therefore you can work for longer too. So what I find is if you're anxious, then you can't focus for as long. Kids are going to need more breaks. Of course, children need more breaks, and you've got to build that up. So routines and repetition. Lots of you have heard me talk about, I think this is why we've got more students diagnosed than ever before. We've taken rote learning and repetition out of classrooms and routines. When I went to school, same spot in the line, same desk, routine repetition. Now, I don't want to go back to routine repetition, but some of your students need to go back to routine and repetition. Remember, um, if you listen to my schedule podcast two weeks ago, part of a schedule is the routine and repetition that they know what's happening when. And remember I said transition starts the night before. Well, for some of my children who have separation anxiety, make sure you listen to that podcast if you haven't. One of the things is to introduce routine and repetition so they know they're going to come straight in and do that Peppa Pig um, activity and they're not making a choice straight away. So I just want to remind you that actually routines and repetition will actually help build confidence that children on the spectrum like doing things over and over. And in my early years book, we say, if you're introducing a new activity, you must do it twice. Don't just do it once, move to the next thing, next the next thing. So when I worked in the autism school, we had start and finish boxes for their work boxes. And every day there would be the same activities in there but we might be extending it a little bit or changing it a little bit. And um, many of you have heard me talk before, we cook pikelets every day for a year. But when we cook the pikelets, we change the outcome. So one day might have been learning about passing a bowl to another child. The next day might have been about learning to put something back in the fridge. The next day might have been working out to something go in the fridge or the pantry. The next day might have been about washing. So we were cooking pikelets, but we were teaching different things from the same activity. Now, the reason I was like, I need to do a workshop on routines and rep, a workshop, a um, podcast on routines and repetitions is because when I did my free webinar this term, so many people, that was the top takeaway to use the same tasks and have a different outcome. 
So I was like, oh, I always do that. If I give a child a word find, we don't do it once. The first time we do the word find, we might do it if they love Star Wars and I've got a Star Wars word find. The first time we might do it just to find the words. The second time we might try and put the words in alphabetical order. The third time we might colour in with different colours. The fourth time I might do it as a turn taking, a social skill. So they have to take turns with a partner to find a word. Um, You know, there's so many different ways. The next time I might be getting the student to write out the words as they find them rather than crossing them out. So same word find, we'll do it for a whole week, but we will adapt the outcome, which is in my original book, Making It a Success, all of the activities I actually have, like I'm just looking at it. It's so funny. I wrote this so long ago and I started reading it today. I'm like, oh, this is so good. I'd forgotten about all these fabulous things, um, which is funny, but because I don't know. I mean, it's a bit like when you find a letter you wrote to a friend a long time ago or a birthday card and you're like, oh, I forgot all about those things. But um, for example, where I've got the days of the weeks and the months of the year, for those of you who have the book on page 63, I've got like five different aims, but six different ways to use the same worksheet, right? So, you know, one's cutting and pasting, one's actually matching, um, one's actually putting them in order, one's writing, one's typing, um, one's getting them to write down significant events that happen in those months. So same activity, then writing, using it for different things. So I just want to point out that when you give a child on the spectrum something they've seen before, often they feel more confident. They know they've seen it before, but you can change the outcome, which might sound a little bit strange, but actually so often that is the case that in my experience in the early years, like I say, I might have a puzzle and the first time they might only be putting one puzzle piece in, then the two puzzle pieces, turn-taking, naming, using words, or for some children who need to learn to point, I might put the puzzle pieces up the top and getting them to point. Now, if you're a secondary school teacher and going, oh, well, Sue, how is this going to work in secondary? I have found over the years, so often staff will get or teachers will get, say in English, a poem. They will get the student to do two or three different activities from one poem. And every time the child gets 50%, however you mark it, but they get 50% because you kept changing the activity. Some of my students would be better off doing exactly the same task, but building up from 50%, learning from the feedback, then to 70%, learning from the feedback, then to 80%. I don't know about you, but when I did year 11 and 12, the main thing I did was pass papers. And I had amazing teachers. I was very lucky at the school I went to. And we would hand them in, they would give me feedback, and then I'd redo the essay. That was how I learned best. Actually, instead of doing a whole new essay, redoing that same essay and getting improving my skills and understanding by redoing. Now, if you have oppositional children or PDA, they probably will not respond very well to this strategy. But what I like to let them do is choose the order then. So I will say, well, okay, we're going to do, say that month's activity. We're going to do one as cutting, one as typing, one as writing, one as what are the major events. And I'll say to them, what order do you want to do it in? So on Monday, you're going to do major events. On Tuesday, you're going to do cutting. On Wednesday, you're going to do typing. So I will let them choose how they're going to use that activity in different ways. So just... uh, I hope that makes sense. I've tried to cover a lot of different ways I use repetition. But the main reason I use repetition, and if you could see me smiling and I'm nearly clapping my hands, is this. It saves me time. If I give the student that I have to just make that one activity and photocopy it five times, it really saves me a lot of time. So it builds their confidence. They're far more confident because they know what to do. It's less preparation for me. Because they're like, oh, I know what I'm doing. And teacher assistants or angels, um, I talk a lot about that in my red and blue books about setting up routines and helping them with start and finish routines. So 
I don't know about you, but I have a before I walk out the door routine, both at home and, you know, when I'm in a classroom. So you might have your, what is your routine when you walk out the door? Are you unplug your phone, get your keys, turn off the lights? For me, the cat and dog or at night, turn on the dishwasher. We all have routines. And I just want you to acknowledge that those routines and repetition mean you don't forget things. So for children with struggle with working memory and executive functioning, this is great. Knowing what to do when and having those routines mean they nearly don't think about it. It's like an autopilot. But then let's pretend I went to um, put the dog out and I couldn't find the dog. Well, there's going to be some flexibility there. And that's why we have to use words like sometimes or maybe or show them flexible thinking, show them what to do if something goes wrong. So one of the things we said in the ultimate guide on page 45 is build routine, but add in flexibility with the choice making. Keep choice making simple and easy at first and gradually make the choices harder. But I think build in flexibility, like I talked about in the schedules, well, it's raining today, we're going to stay inside And you can choose to do a board game or watch YouTube, you know, so you can build in that flexibility. And just a reminder, you always give students real choices. So it's not, what are you going to do inside? Are you going to do a board game or are you going to watch YouTube? And then at which board game are you going to play? Are you going to play Connect Four or um, Snap or you know? Are you going to watch YouTube on garbage trucks or on Star Wars, you know? Be clear about the choices because often this is where we get procrastination. If you give them very broad choice, they'll start something, change, start something, change. So make sure they tell you what their choices are. And again, that then helps them remember what they're doing. I find by them verbalizing or showing, um, this actually helps them and it helps them be flexible because they've work through the choices with you rather than you just telling them, particularly for the oppositional students or students who um, can become quite rigid, that you're going to walk them through those changes. So the sorts of routines I think you should think about are start and finish routines. What are their getting started routine? Um, Now, this is where having a set spot on the mat. Some of my students, when they move to the mat, Trying to find a choice, a spot is like trying to find a spot to park your car. I don't know about you. I have this weird thing that when there's a lot of car parks in a center, I sort of have more trouble choosing where to park. Where if there's only one car park, I tend to park there and squeeze in no matter what. Where if there's too many choices, I overthink it. Like, oh, there's a pole or where? how will that work with a shopping trolley? Whereas if I only have one choice, I just do it. So this is where routines often really help students because they're not trying to find a spot on the mat. They're not trying to find where they're going to work. So think about where you can build in repetition. Now, any of you going, but Sue, you know, they should be able to move around on the mat. Well, is that working? Or are they swapping around like me in the car park? Are you better off with them having a set spot on the mat? Are are they able to find that spot on the mat? Or So choose your battles. You know, it's like some of my children are fine lining up and have are good at having a set um, going wherever they end up in the line. But some of my students, that lining up causes them anxiety. So let's give them a set spot in the line. Some of my students are very good at going back to their desk and opening up their book and getting started. Some of my students actually need a little reminder about that. You know, go back to your desk, get your pencil, get your pen. So building up those specific um routines for getting started, which is in the um, teacher assistant um, book on page 23. Like you might attach their pen on a string, but some of my children don't like the feel of the string. So you might have a blob of blue tack I have found over the years. If they lie the pen or pencil down, just standing up can be a um, risk if kids fall. So just lying their pencil down in the blue tack means it's attached to the desk and not going to roll off. You might color code their books. See, that's a routine, having the color codes. You might declutter their workspace. That is creating a routine and keeping that repetition where things go back. I like putting a bookmark in their books. So whenever they finish work, the finish routine is put the bookmark in the book before I close it, 
lie down my pencil in the blue tack, put my rubber away in my pencil case, push in my chair. What are the routines? And this is where I love, you can either take photos of those routines and have them on their desk or kinesthetically, actually physically guiding them through the routines. Don't tell them, don't show them, physically do it together. Now, I know we're not meant to touch children anymore, but some of my student children do need that coactiveness. I find that coactiveness helps them set up routines. So it might be come in and hang up the bag, but do that hand over hand with them. And then open your bag and get out your drink bottle, get out your reader, get out any notes, actually physically show them that. I find even in secondary, physically showing them how to stand their books up, showing them the color coding, helping them stick their timetable in their locker rather than just telling them to do it. So doing things coactively is such a powerful strategy. Um, The other thing, if you um, have students who um, get anxious about um, they haven't finished their work, I like to have a box for work to finish later or a tub they put things in to finish later because some of my students, that can make them anxious. Remember also to, with repetition and routines, you need your schedules and you need those timers. Make sure you listen to the episode two weeks ago where I talk about the power of schedules, routines and visuals. See, I'm still adding visuals to these routines and repetition. Um, So looking at start and finish routines. I like a five-minute warning, but are you a five-minute before you walk out the door person or a 10-minute? Have a think. Does your student need a five-minute warning or a 10-minute warning? Um, Those of you in the early years, if they're in the playground or doing something they love or in the sandpit, they might need more like a 10-minute than a five-minute warning. But remember, part of the routine is them knowing where they're going. So on the timer, you might have a visual that they're lining up or sitting on the mat net, reminding them what they're doing once they're finished so they know where they're going. But if you have a routine, then you don't need to be reminded. If you know your routine is, I'm going from the sandpit to lining up every day and I'm going to be lined up and my partner's going to be Nathan and we're going to be third in the line. If your routine is that you know that after maths, you sit on the mat. Whereas what I find in schools, one day they sit on the mat, one day they line up, one day they move to the classroom next door. Well, for some of my students, you need to choose your battles. You know, which is the important bit? Sometimes the more routines, the calmer the whole class is. If all the kids know unfinished work goes in that tub, that their work, you know, that they push in their chairs when they're finished. I mean, just think about it. There's so many routines that we can put in place. But if we're always moving where they're sitting, how they're sitting, then they've got to get their equipment, move their equipment, they lose things. So I just ask you to really think about how can you build in routines and repetition? Because in my experience, the more routines, the more repetition, the higher the engagement and the calmer the students are. So when you introduce something new, and I particularly talk about this in my early years book on page 31. When you introduce anything new, I want you to show it to them at least twice. So I just want you to pick one activity this week that you were thinking, oh, we're just going to do that once, you know, and think, okay, what about we do that puzzle twice? How about we do that word find twice? How about we do that um, game twice? How about we do that video twice? How can I build in repetition? Because my guess is what you're actually doing for the neurotypical students is building in variety because they like seeing, okay, let me say, let's say we're watching a video on Antarctica and animals. The rest of the class might like seeing um, two different David Attenborough videos on different Antarctic animals. Well, the child on the spectrum might like watching the same video twice. So could we just let them watch the same video twice? And if we're taking notes from that video, many of my children, when they watch it twice, they're going to get more notes. They're going to learn more by watching it twice. Now, again, autism spectrum is so individual. Not every strategy works for everybody. So that mightn't be a good example of you, of something that works for you. But I want you to think, 
Could I do that poem twice in the secondary? What are activities I can do twice? Do you think someone turns up at the Olympics and just runs a race once? I mean, they, they do repetitive, they do training, they do the same activities over and over. They might be running a 100 meter race, but my guess is they do a lot of skills to be good at that 100 meter race. But at the end of the day, it's about routine and repetition. If you look at athletes, they normally have the same music they listen to. They have the same routine. Um, A lot of athletes, that's one of the, you know, if you follow sport, if they're away, if they're the away team, they're less likely to win. Why is that? They're sleeping in a different bed. They're out of routine. So all of us thrive in routines. So I would love you to really think, What is the goal? Why am I changing everything all the time? Am I going to get better outcomes by using repetition? Am I going to get better outcomes by having a routine? How much time is this student wasting because they don't know where to start? How much time is this student wasting because they can't find things? How much stress am I having as a family at bedtime because we don't have a set routine to go to bed? Alarm goes off at, say... I mean, an alarm goes off that it's bedtime. When I was a kid, the TV show finished and we all knew when it was bedtime. I always ask this at my workshops and most people will say there was a specific TV show. We don't have that anymore. So how about everyone in the family has an alarm at say 8.30 bedtime? What happens at 8.30? And have a set routine because you sleep better if you go to bed at a set routine. I don't know about you, but I have a set bedtime. If I go to bed then, boom, straight to sleep. If I don't go to bed then, as my girlfriend would say to her daughter when she was little, you miss the train station. And literally, it is like a train station. What are your set routines? So have a really good think about this. Now, the main reason that kids on the spectrum love routines and repetition is because of their executive functioning challenges. And executive functioning means working memory, problem solving. Yes, So if you have trouble with working memory, the more routines, the less you have to remember. If you have trouble with problem solving, if things are back in the same spot, then you won't lose them. So I'd love you to really to sit back and when you're planning out this week, think what are the routines and repetition I can put in place. If you're with children in the early years, this is where I love to like laminate the worksheet and they write on it with a whiteboard texture and rub it out, white, write on it and rub it out. But again, not every strategy works for everybody because as I was saying that, I was thinking of one of my little girls that didn't like getting the whiteboard texture on herself, so I was better off printing out the same worksheet. But one of the things I do for some of my children who struggle with handwriting, a lot of the um, board maker and activities that I do for children with like classic autism, you know, I struggle with all the terms around autism, but you know what I mean by classic autism. It might be a student with limited communication or nonverbal. Actually laminate, say I was doing a one to 10 activity, if you laminate and then have the numbers and say they love Thomas, I'd have the numbers one to 10 on Thomas. If you laminate them and Velcro them, then all the child has to do is Velcro the numbers in order. But you can do that same activity every day. I actually had a little boy years ago who loved the very hungry caterpillar and I use that for all our activities. So I'd have like the apple from the um, very hungry hungry caterpillar and I'd have the apples and he would have to like put them in order with the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten with the apples. And the next we might have um, the caterpillar and he'd have to put them in size order from small to big. But they were Velcroed because he really struggled with fine motor and so he could just stick on the Velcro. Now, again, some of your students won't like the sound of Velcro, so then you might have to use blue tack. So there's ways around it. One of the things um, that I'm going to encourage you to be is flexible. When we build in repetition and routines, a lot of it is about us being flexible to go, what is the goal here? All I care is the child learns to count to 1 to 10. Does it matter we're doing the same, you know, knows the order of 1 to 10? Does it matter we're doing the same apples every day? Does it matter we're doing that same word find in different ways? Because I think a lot of it is our neurotypical brain gets bored. 
And I am a classic of that. I love rearranging my classroom. But when I was teaching in an autism school, I did not rearrange my classroom. Everything went back in the same spot because I know the smallest change would make my students very anxious. And then that would make it hard for me to teach because the higher the anxiety, the lower the problem solving and the less choices they can make and engage. So I really love you to think about routines and repetition. Um, And just a reminder, it is important we introduce some variety, but just really, you know, small things. You know, you don't create variety like, oh, I put the car keys somewhere different because I thought you need some variety. And I really want you to think about that learning to drive, that when you're first learning to drive, that sensory overwhelm, when a child comes into your classroom, that sensory overwhelm. But once you're in a routine, then you can add bits on. So once the child's in a routine of putting their pencil back, putting the rubber away, or then they're going to start work quicker the next time because they're not looking for the pencil. They're not looking for the rubber. They've got that bookmark. They know where things are. So the more routines and repetition I think the higher the engagement. Don't have to agree with everything I say. This is just an idea to try on. But I really did look back through all my books and thought, I do talk about routines. I do talk about repetition, but I don't talk about enough that this is like the the overlook strategy that we are using our students love of repetition. If you look what they love doing, my guarantee is they like doing a similar activity over and over. It might be jumping on a trampoline, watching the same show. So why don't we use that to then build up their confidence and build, um, reduce their anxiety and have them more engaged in activities. So Best of luck with all of this. Make sure you look at the blog where there'll be some more tips and strategies to make a difference to you and the children you know. I hope you've got some great tips and strategies to make a difference. Remember, strategies wear out and not every strategy works for everybody. If you're ready to dive in deeper to more strategies and ideas to make a difference, I'd highly recommend you consider Dr. Tony Atwood or my online courses. For more information, visit my website, www.sulaki.com.au.